Well, on this uh, special Mother's Day, we'll take a, a step away from uh, 1 Corinthians and look at uh, some scripture, uh, scripture passage today that uh, has a focus on the, the role of, of women, mothers in God's church and in His kingdom as we study here. And it's very important for us to, to get this, understand this. Um, for, for many years, I've shared with you guys that in particular I have a, I have a passion towards you know, speaking to men and, and, and talking to men about uh, embracing the, the biblical role that, that God has, has given us as men and fathers. And, and sometimes, I, not that, I don't pay as quite as much attention to, to the, the biblical role and expectation um, for women in, in such a, a challenging sense that I do with men. But uh, what, we, we, what we'll study today is a, is a challenging thing. It's a challenge uh, to women uh, to serve uh, as disciples and dis- disciple makers in God's church. So uh, understand that what we're talking about today is focused on, on women. But we can understand these principles uh, that men need to apply them in, in their lives and and this section of, of Titus that we're studying is also in a, in a bigger section where instruction is given to, to men as well. So it's not that men are off the hook uh, with what we're talking about today, but the particular focus is on women. So uh, Titus chapter 2, verses 3 through 5 is their focus today. The scripture says, Older women likewise are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good, so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, so that the word of God will not be dishonored. Let's pray. Father, Uh, We're grateful to be able to study today, to be able to celebrate mothers, to be able to celebrate you, to be able to study your word. Uh, I pray, Father, that as we go through this scripture, our hearts and minds are open to your intent uh, for for what you say here, um, being able to understand it as as from you, uh, without the the fallen nature of man. I pray that we can uh, remove that as much as possible from our understanding of what it is we're studying today uh, so that uh, we can make application in our lives to to bring you glory and to bring you honor. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we we start working through this scripture, you know, as we read it, uh, you, you know, you might, your first response to some of these things that we read might be, my goodness, you know, why are we, why are we studying this today? And certainly that would be a worldly reaction just to, to some of the surface level things uh, that, that are read here in these particular verses. But hopefully you'll understand as we dig deeper and, and, and get into what is the intent of this, of how special and precious this word is that we're studying today. Now, the first thing we see as we're talking about this is that this is really a model for discipleship. The, these verses, these three, three four, and five are, are for the woman, but then you see in the other verses, there's a disciple for, for men, there's a disciple uh, for, for children, there's a disciple uh, plan and model for, for workers as well. And in particular today, we'll focus on the plan for women, mothers. And so the first thing that we'll see is that there is indeed an expectation that discipleship is going to be taking place in this church. Uh, Paul is writing this letter to Titus. One of the, Titus is one of the young pastors who had, who had come up uh, under Paul's tutelage, been on missionary journeys with him. Um, he worked in the church at Corinth. He's uh, worked on, on the island of Crete. So Titus has been in several places. But uh, Paul is, is now sending him this letter, uh, giving him some, some instruction on, on how to lead the discipleship plan wherever it is he is, whatever church he may be in at the time, you know, wherever, whatever town he may be in, he said, hey, here's a discipleship plan for you. And, and the expectation is, is that, you know, not if you get around to discipleship, 
Not if, if you guys, you know, take care of, of everything else and, and then you can get to, to discipleship. No, the, the expectation is that this is going to be going on. The older men are pouring into the younger men. The older women are pouring into uh, the younger women. Uh, this is how you live the Christian life. This is what you do. And so there's this expectation, this understanding that this is going to be taking place in the church. Now, particularly these verses that we're studying today point and he's speaking to the women in the church. And he says, first of all, older women, older women. And so what does he mean when he's when he's talking to older women here? We can we can get some insight uh, as to what Paul means. Uh, you can study some of his other writings. You can go into his letters to Timothy and you can see that at one point he tells them when, when taking care of widows, if, if a woman is is over 60, 60 or over, she's to be put on the list. She's to be put on the list uh, to be taken care of by the church. Under 60, there's the expectation that she, she could probably be remarried. Um, this idea that she might still have children that she's raising. So they would you know, recommend that she be remarried. So by extension, then, we, might, we, can, we can make the, the understanding that when he's addressing older women here, uh, we can go at it two ways. He's talking about women who are either over 60 or women who have finished raising their own children. And so that's what he has in mind here. He's talking to, to older women, women who are over 60 or are finished raising their children. And so the expectation is that you older women, and we'll get into this, you're to live a certain way, have certain behaviors, and you then are expected to pour into younger women. If you're, you're finished raising your children, then you go and you start pouring into women who are still raising their children. You, you minister to these women. You help them in various ways. You, you teach them uh, the ways of the scriptures. You teach them the ways of the Lord. Now, there's also then this idea that's present here of the responsibility not just lying with the older women, but with younger women, younger women, the younger women then should have the expectation because we're talking about expectations. Younger women should have the expectation that this is going to be happening in their local church. Younger women are, should have the expectation that, hey, in this place, I can expect to be getting poured into. I can expect to be getting discipled. I can expect that I'm going to be growing in my relationship with the Lord because some older more wisdom-filled, more experienced-filled woman is going to be pouring into me. And so the expectation for discipleship works both ways there. And we've got to understand this, ladies, that this call, this call that he has here is not singled out for Kay Arthur or Priscilla Shire or Beth Moore, you know, not, not just these 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 ladies that are, that are particularly and specially called to a teaching ministry or, or discipleship uh, like they are. This is for every Christian woman to consider. Every Christian woman has to be considering, all right, where am I? Where am I in this, in this explanation that he has? Older woman or younger woman? And then you have to figure out, all right, am I discipling someone? Am I pouring into someone? Or you have to figure out, hey, is someone pouring into me? Am I being discipled? Am I being prepared to disciple the next generation? And so this, this, is, this is the bottom line on this, this idea of expectation, that we've got to be thinking that this has to be taking place in our church. And as we think on this, as we ask these questions and answer these questions, if we come up with no answers to this, then we've got to fix it. We've got to do something about it. If we find yes answers to this, then, hey, we keep on. But, you know, if we, also, if we find yes answers to it, we keep on doing it, but we teach others how to do it. We encourage others to do this, do, to do this as well. But this has got to be, this, there's an expectation that this is a part of God's church. This is part of of a healthy, living, breathing church that discipleship is going on. Now, as we, as we continue through the scripture, 
and, and understand that there's going to be this expectation for discipleship, then we have to understand that one of the, one of the first ways that discipleship takes place is through behavior, through behavior. And, and that is, in effect, modeling uh, discipleship uh, through the way that you live, through the way that you carry yourself, through the things that you do. And so in, in, in verse 3, we see older women, likewise, are to be reverent in their behavior. And so it, it, the first thing that, that we see, that, that one of the first ways that, that you can be discipling someone, kind of, this is, this is even hands-off type of thing where you're not necessarily meeting with someone, but as an older woman, younger women in the church can be watching the way that you, beha- that you behave, watching the way that you live your life, and they can be gleaning valuable information from this. They can be, they can be seeing that, hey, okay, this is the pattern for behavior that's expected of me, biblically. This is the way that I should be living. And the first thing that he gets to is, is this idea of, of reverent behavior. And keep in mind, we're talking about reverent behavior, not towards any man, not towards any human being, but towards God, towards God. Now, listen, if I'm acting right towards God, guess who else I'm going to be acting right towards? The people in my life, okay? But first and foremost, primarily what we're talking about here, he says reverent behavior, this, this humble behavior, respectful behavior. Consistent behavior it is the idea behind this, I, this, this word here that's, that's said reverent. Over in 1 Peter chapter 3, we get uh, a good description, I think, of, of reverent behavior. First few verses here, it says, In the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of of their wives as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. Your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry or putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. And and that's, that's the big idea of this reverent behavior. What he, what he hones in on there in verse 4. The hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit. And it matters to who? Which is precious in the sight of God. You see, I, we might have lost some people with those first three verses. Where it's talking about being submissive to your own husband. And, and, and so that he can be one without a word by your chaste behavior. You know, sometimes people hear that and they're like, well, No, 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 that's not me. That's that's not the world that we live in today. But the idea is that this is precious in the sight of God. It pleases God that you behave this way. It pleases God that you have this, this reverent behavior about you, that you're reverent towards him. I hope that we want to please God. And if I read that this is what pleases God, guess what I should do? I should do what pleases God. And so it's very clear that that's what pleases him. So reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, not malicious gossip. Now understand, part of what, what, what Paul is, is, is addressing here are, are things that are, that are going on in Titus's church, in the church that he's serving or the churches that he has served. He's not, this is not necessarily a blanket statement that just because you're a woman, you're prone to malicious gossip, Okay. So, you know, we can, we can back off of that idea. The world can back off of that idea that, that, the, that the Bible has these uh, sexist attitudes towards women, okay? But if gossip is your thing, you got to back off of it. Got to back off of it. You know, now, someone might, might make the argument, he's, he just says malicious gossip, all right? So if I'm, not, if I'm not talking bad stuff, I can still talk. I wouldn't go there. But you want to back off. It's just like he says, not enslaved to much wine. Okay? Someone might see that and say, well, he says, to much wine. Maybe I can still go right to the edge, right? That's not the idea. That's not the idea. The idea is that our behavior is, is reverent 
and respectful. And so when it comes to gossip, when it ta- comes to, to, to wine, we, we need to be sure that we're not carried away. We're not carried away in, in anything that we may engage in. That we're always considering that someone is watching. Someone is watching you. Not just God the Father, but younger women are watching your behavior. And as they see you behave a certain way, what are they going to think? Well, if they behave this way, if she, you know, she's, she's mature in, in her faith, she's, she's been a believer for this amount of time, she does this in the church, she does that in the church, if she be- behaves this way, then it's okay for me to behave this way. That, that's, just, that's just the thought process of people. That's what we do when we see behavior patterned a certain way. We're going we're to follow that. And so the, the opportunity here is for the older women in the church to model sound biblical behavior. Now understand this. This is not just for the 60 and over crowd to model this behavior. Because you're older than somebody, aren't you? Unless you were just born this morning. You know, right at that moment, you might not be older than somebody. But eventually, you're going to be older than somebody. And so, understanding that if you're older than somebody, somebody is watching you. And so, you've got to consider your behavior because it has an impact on people. It will also then impact the, the, the next step of discipleship. Remember now, we're just talking about discipleship from a standpoint of people watching you. But as we continue reading and studying this morning, we're going to see that discipleship takes a next step to actually being intentional about uh, having relationships with people and, and pouring into them intentionally. And so uh, understand this, that if, if my behavior is such that it's, it's totally opposite of being reverent, and then I go to somebody and say, hey, you know, let, let, me, let me disciple you. Listen to what I say. It, it becomes a, a do what I say rather than a do what I do type thing. And, and that's not the best scenario. That's not the best scenario for, for discipleship to take place. And so this is one of those reasons that we want to uh, be sure and watch how we are behaving. Now, we're going to consider the disciples' legacy. Because what he says here in verse 3, older women likewise are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good, so that, so that they may encourage the young women. So that they may encourage the young women. Here's the other part, and perhaps I think the most important part of discipleship. This is where relationship comes into, in, into, into play. This is where one-on-one, one-on-two, one-on-three relationships come into play. This is where it, it is important, so important, that the older women then be reaching out to younger women. And younger women, as I've said, younger women, if, if, you, if, if you're sensing a lack of older women reaching out to you, then you go to them. You go to them and, and you find somebody and ask for this. But the idea here is that as, as this encur- for this encouragement to take place so that the older women can encourage the younger women, there's got to be regular relationship, regular talking about the things of Christ, regularly talking about the things of the scriptures. The, the reason, one of the reasons that, that Paul, though, makes the distinction for, for older women taking the lead in doing this is that you've raised your children. Your children are, are, are out of the home, is what he's talking about here. You're, and, and we understand that you're, you know, your children are always your children. You're always doing things to pour into their heart. But you're not quite as busy with your children anymore once they have gotten out of the home. And so perhaps now you have more time on your hands to be able to take advantage of some opportunities to pour into these younger women, to initiate the conversation, to initiate the, the meeting once a month, twice a month, whatever it might be, where you guys get together and you talk about the scriptures, you talk about life, you pray, you, you, you find a book study that you're going to go through, you find a, a, a DVD study, whatever it is, you get two or three women, you get one woman, 
whatever it is. But you have, if, if indeed you do have that time on your hands, then this is why you do it. To encourage the younger women. And then as you're doing that, you, 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 see, you see how the legacy, the, the idea of legacy develops here. Because not only have you spent years pouring into your own children, and you're going to continue doing that, but now you're pouring into, into other women in the church, and they learn this behavior from you, and guess what these younger women are going to do? They're going to get older, and as they get older, they're going to find younger women to pour into. And, and then this, this wonderful, beautiful cycle continues. Can you guess what happens to a church when this isn't happening? Can you guess what happens to a church when neither older women or older men are pouring into younger women or younger men? A church dies. A church dies. And multiple churches die. Because there's no legacy to continue. There's no one walking in the way of the word so that they teach people in the way of the word. There might be some still walking in the way of the word, but they're not teaching anyone to walk in it. And, and, and as we stop teaching and discipling others to walk in the way of the word, then we get further and further and further apart from the scriptures and from the church being a, a healthy and influential organization, if you will. And so, guys, th this, is, this is one of the most important things for us to grasp as a church is that we've got to, we've got to be doing this. If, if, if you're concerned at all about the health and the future and the impact of New Bethel Baptist Church, then yeah, we, we get involved in Impact Garner, we get involved in evangelism, we get involved in, in every outreach opportunity there is. But we've got to get involved in discipleship. We've got to get involved in, in, in pouring into each other's lives. We've got to get in the business of growing disciples, of growing disciples who make disciples. And this is the way that it happens. It, 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 it's the best discipleship plan there is. This idea of older pouring in to younger. Are you? Are we? Are you doing this? Are we doing this? Legacy is important. The, the final thing we'll see is the disciples' challenge challenge of discipleship. Verse 5 uh, and verse 4. So after encouraging the idea of older women encouraging younger women, here comes the challenge. And, and I'm going to talk about two aspects of challenge. The challenge for the disciple, this kind of ties into the behavior that we talked about, but the challenge for the disciple then is to live a certain way. To live a certain way in the world that we live in. To live a certain way that is very much contrary to the ideas of the world that we live in. Now, one of the reasons that what we're about to talk about is so contrary to the way of the world is because, by and large, we haven't done, not, I'm not just talking about here, but the church in general has not done a great job of discipleship. And so, in general, as we have failed more and more at discipleship, the world has gone further and further away from the scriptures and understanding what the scriptures mean. So then when we start talking about loving your husband this way and loving your children this way and, and being submissive to your own husband and respecting your own husband, the world hears that and they're like, what in the world are you talking about? What world are you living in that, that's so foreign to the world? And partly that's our responsibility because we have failed at discipleship. But here's the challenge. Here's the challenge. So that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children. Now you might hear that at first. Well, that's, that's not very challenging. Of course, I love my husband and I love my children. But you know there are days that that's tough. There are days that that's a, that's a tough thing to do. But here's the idea. That you will love your husband 
and love your children even when it's hard. Even when they are unlovable. You might think, you know, even when they're tracking mud or doing... No, it's so much deeper than that. So much deeper than that. Love them when they're being disobedient as children. Love them when they have totally gone the wrong way. Totally gone away from the Scriptures. Love your husband even when he is being disobedient to the Word of God. Love your husband, as Peter said that we just read, so that he may be one without a word when he is being disobedient. This is the idea of love that is so familiar to us that we, that we read in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love is patient. Love is kind and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. And so this is, this is the love that, that Paul has in mind here as he writes to Titus. This is the love he has in mind of, of teaching the women to love their husbands and love their children with love that way. He also says to be sensible. To be sensible. Don't, you know, don't, get, don't get carried away with, with, with wild flights of emotion, but be sensible. Be consistent. Be wise. This, this idea of being sensible comes from wisdom. Wisdom comes from the fear of the Lord. This is how we, we get to live this sensible way. Be, be pure pure, holy, righteous before the Lord. Workers at home. Workers at home. Now, the idea here is that, you know, not that you can't work outside of the home. Now, some would have that belief that, that the, the idea here is to, that women should not work outside the home. But even if you are working outside, outside the home, the idea is, is that still the home is the center of your affection. That even if you're working outside the home, that you still are making sure that the home is your priority. It's your priority because that's, that's your, your first place of discipleship is in your home with your children, if you, if you indeed have children. So that, that's the idea here. Uh, be kind. Be subject to your own husband. And, and this idea of being subject to your own husband, it's, it's explained so beautifully in Ephesians 5. In Ephesians 5, Paul talks, is writing here about husbands and wives being submissive, being subject to one another as they are subject to, to who? Newly married people. Who are we subject to? God, to the Lord, right? They know that because we went through premarital counseling together. So. They knew that answer. But the idea here is that, is that we're, we're subject to one another as we're subject to God. Subject to God. And so that's what he has in mind here. But there's this, also this idea. He says you're subject to who? To your own husband. And that doesn't mean that every man gets to run around telling every other woman what she has to do. It doesn't even mean that every man gets to tell his own wife what she has to do. The idea is that your one flesh relationship is with your husband. Your husband. You don't have that relationship with anyone else. Husband, your one flesh relationship is with your wife. You don't have that type of relationship with anyone else. Be subject to one another as you're subject to the Lord. And the whole idea, the whole idea in doing this is so that the word of God will not be dishonored. So that the word of God will not be dishonored. That's so important to have there and to understand. It's so important because of the, 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 the natural inclination to push back against some of this that, that may take place in our hearts as, as we read it, as we hear it, as we understand it. Well, I don't, you know, don't want to do this. I don't, don't want to do that. <clears throat> but when we understand that this is so that the word of God will not be dishonored. 
That, that, that puts a, a different spin on it. That, that, that helps us to understand the motivation for, for being this type of wife, this type of woman, this type of mother. The bigger idea here is that, is that you're being church mothers. You're, you're called to be a church mother. You're called to, to grow into this idea of, of mothering more than, more than just the children that God has blessed you with. But mothering, in a biblical sense, more and more daughters. That, that's in particular who your call is to. To mother your own, but then mother some of these women in the church. Are you? Are we doing that? There's another part of this challenge that, that I want to deliver to you today. I believe, as I've stated earlier, that this idea of discipleship is the most crucial thing for the church in general and for New Bethel Baptist Church. Discipleship, being, engage in, being engaged intentionally in relationships with other believers, with younger believers, believers uh, younger, newer in their spiritual maturity than you are, it is absolute key to the survival, and not just the survival, but the thriving of God's church here at New Bethel. It is absolutely fundamental. It's fundamental. Now, I can talk about it and I can, I can deliver a sermon that says it's, it's most important and then just kind of leave it at that and, and leave, it, leave it to you to figure it out. But I'm not going to do that. I, I, I'm going I'm to go a step further today. I, I, I've introduced this to, to some ladies already, but I want to introduce to all of you and challenge you and give you a tool to use in this discipleship relationship that the scriptures say that you should have with younger women. Um, some of you have heard, heard me talk about and heard other men talk about over the last couple years a Bible study that, that we men went through called Kingdom Man by Tony Evans. And the, the fellas that, that went through that, I'm sure, would, would give a hearty, a hearty amen to, to the impact that it, that it had on us. Well, Pastor Evans has a Bible study called Kingdom Woman. Kingdom Woman. He, he and his daughter, he and one of his daughters have, have done this, this Bible study. And my, my offer to you is this as a tool. My challenge to you, my challenge to you as, as women in this church is who will say, who will say, I will host it. I will lead it. Uh, you... Yes, I'll, I'll grab five, six women, 10, 12 women, whoever it is, and, and invite them to my house, invite them to this church, wherever it is. But let me just say this. I think, I think, I think the, the home, I think our homes are one of the greatest places and ways to practice Christian hospitality. I think when we consider that, that we live in one of the most uh, prosperous nations, industrialized nations that the, that the world has ever known, and consider that God has blessed us with, with wonderful homes that most of the world looks at and, and, and would never dream of being able to live in even a $150,000 home, a $120,000, $100,000 home. People across the world would be like, my goodness. And we're blessed to live in homes like that. And I think one of the, one of the things that we ought to do in, in, in considering our thanksgiving to God for these homes is to use them as ministry tools to use them to host Bible studies, to host uh, fellowship times with, with, with brothers and sisters in Christ. And so the challenge to you, ladies, whether you do it in your home or, or, or host it here at the church, who will accept the challenge of, of discipling a woman or women? Who will accept the challenge of using this Bible study? Or if there's another one that you want to use. But I want to give you a tool. I want you to know that there's something that, that is wonderful to use. That you can use. I want you to see a, a little trailer information about it. You guys can show that now. 
has plenty of girls. Girly girls, mean girls, game playing girls, gossip girls, and yes, even church ladies. But what this world needs right now are girls who are also kingdom women. As a child of the king, God has placed his image inside of you. Living as a kingdom woman means that you are reflecting him and his kingdom in such a remarkable fashion that people will want to know more about the king you represent. Hello, my name is Tony Evans. I don't know how you think and feel about yourself right now, whether you are discouraged, depressed, whether you feel life has been unfair to you. Those may be your circumstances, but that's not who you are. God has created you to be a king of women, a woman operating under his rule. And when you understand that's who you are, and when you operate in light of that, all of a sudden life changes because you have a heavenly perspective regardless of your earthly circumstances. That's why Kristen and I wrote the book Kingdom Woman, to challenge you to look higher than where you are to whose you are and be transformed by the truth of being a kingdom woman. Heaven knows we don't need more girls being girls. What we need and what our world needs for us to do is to step up and live our lives like the kingdom woman we were created to be. Women, together we can change our world. We can make it a better place for ourselves, our children, our families, our churches, and our communities. Kingdom women are strong women who understand that God has uniquely called them to leave a lasting impact on the lives they touch. Discover more about your destiny as a kingdom woman when you pick up this book by Dr. Tony Evans, author of the bestseller Kingdom Man, and his daughter Crystal Evans Hurst. So I, I hope you'll understand that, that the heartbeat of, uh, of what I'm saying today and, and getting at is that as, as a woman of God, as a mother, perhaps the greatest opportunity you have is to share that, to share that and to teach and encourage other women and to understand how that can Im impact generations to come, generations to follow. It is, it is at once your, your great responsibility, there's no doubt, it, it, it's, it's responsibility, but it's also your great opportunity to represent your father, to give him glory, to give him honor, to see, to see him made famous in the next generation. I hope and I pray that you will consider it. And not just consider it, but that you'll do it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for, for the, the mothers that, that are here today. I, again, God, I, I thank you for uh, the, the effort, the tireless effort that so many of them have poured into, into their families the love and the grace and the mercy that they've extended to their children, to their grandchildren, and seeing all the time that that is, that is a picture of you. It's a, it's a reflection of the love, grace, and mercy that you extend to us. We're grateful for, for the way that we're, we have already been able to see you living in them. Thank you, God, that we have fine examples of motherhood represented here in this church. I pray, Father, that, that as we've studied the, the scripture this morning uh, regarding discipleship and, and pouring into uh, to other women, I, I pray, Father, that the message is, is, is well received, the message of your scripture is well received, and that we are encouraged about the opportunity that we have uh, to, to spread your message, to grow disciples. Uh, I pray, Father, uh, that as we, as we engage in this, as as mothers and as men consider God, our role in, in engaging and making disciples, that we will be just motivated and excited by the opportunity to see your kingdom expand, to see your church healthy and living and breathing and impacting the community and the world around us. 
we understand, Father, that uh, your ideas for, for the way you use us for impact are, are big. Uh, we, 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 we can oftentimes think in, in, a, in a local fashion, just as I heard someone saying the other day, God, that, uh, but you're not just a local God. You're, you're, you're a universal God. I pray, Father, that as we think about the impact that you can have, that, that we think of you that way, that we think of you as not just a, a, a local God, but of a universal God, one who has powers beyond what we can imagine, the ability to influence, the ability to equip, the ability to train, shape, and mold us in ways that we could never dream of being ourselves. There, there might be a woman here today, God, thinking that, you know what, I, I'd love to do it, but I'm not equipped. I, I, I can't lead. I can't do this. But, Father, your word says otherwise. Your word has the expectation that older women are to be pouring into younger women. So if, you have that, if your word has that expectation, we've got to understand that you have or will equip us to do that when, when the opportunity is presented. Help us to trust you for that, believe you for that, Father, and glorify you through doing it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.